Previously, we talked about why you might consider using an RTOS and how to run multiple tasks in free RTOS. Now, let's dig a little deeper into how the scheduler works. When we write a multi-threaded program, it looks something like this. In main, we do all of our setup and then create whatever threads or tasks we need. From our perspective, these all look like while forever loops running independently and at the same time. If we're doing things on a microcontroller, we might even add hardware-based interrupts to handle things like timer overflows, pin changes, transmit a message, and so on. However, what actually happens during runtime is a little different. Let's imagine that we're looking at processor utilization over time, which moves from left to right. If we only have one core available to us, it needs to divide its time among the different tasks that we wrote. Most RTOSs use a form of time slicing, where one of the hardware timers interrupts the processor at regular intervals. You'll commonly see a time slice of one millisecond in free RTOS, and that's exactly what's going on inside of our ESP32. I've listed priority slots as the rows in this diagram, and tasks can run in those slots, depending on the priority we've given them. The operating system is required to run every time slice to figure out which task to schedule next. The timer calls this scheduler task at every interval, which is one millisecond in our case. This interval is also known as a tick. The scheduler looks at the tasks that need to run and chooses the one with the highest priority. Let's say that task A has a very low priority and it's the only task that needs to run. So the scheduler chooses it and task A runs for the rest of the time slice. The tick timer then interrupts the task and calls the scheduler to run again. Task A has not finished what it needs to do, so the scheduler lets it finish running as there are still no other higher priority tasks. Before this interval is done, task A calls the VTask delay function for two ticks and enters the blocked state. The next time the scheduler is called counts as one of the ticks for that delay. However, it still has one more tick to wait and the scheduler has no other tasks in the ready state. So the operating system just idles for one tick. At that point, task A's delay is over and is ready to run again, so the scheduler lets it run. At some point during this tick, tasks B and C enter the ready state. These are higher priority tasks, but they still must wait for the next tick to run. When the scheduler runs this time, it sees that tasks A, B, and C are all ready to run. Since B and C are priority 1, which is higher than A's priority 0, they get scheduled to run. B and C are equal priority, and so the scheduler executes each task in turn in a round-robin fashion. B and C will continue taking turns like this so long as they need to run. This is known as preemptive scheduling because CPU time is taken away from one task, task A, to run other higher priority tasks. Keep in mind that this is all done in software. We have not talked about hardware interrupts yet. Unless you do something in code to specifically disable hardware interrupts, a hardware interrupt will always have a higher priority over other software running. The only exception to this is that a hardware interrupt may or may not preempt another hardware interrupt service routine. That's called nested interrupts and depends a lot on your particular hardware and configuration. It doesn't have much to do with the RTOS, so we won't get into it here. For now, I recommend having only one interrupt service routine run at a time and trying to keep them as short as possible. Whenever an ISR is done running, execution will return to whichever task was running. Once tasks B and C are complete or go into the blocked or suspended state, the scheduler will then allow the lower priority task A to run. In a multi-core system, a scheduler may choose to put some tasks on another core. For example, if we let the ESP IDF scheduler decide how to allocate tasks between the cores, it may allow task B and task C to run at exactly the same time on separate cores. Because this makes some of the examples and demos more complicated, we'll stick to using one core for now. The free RTOS scheduler maintains a record of what state each task is in. When a task is created, it automatically enters the ready state. Here, the task is telling the scheduler that it's ready to run at any time. The scheduler can choose to run that task only if there are no other higher priority tasks waiting to run. If a task is not run because another task of equal or higher priority was chosen, then it remains in the ready state. If a task is chosen by the scheduler to run, it will enter the run state and remain in that state while it is using the processor. 
If the processor has only one core, then there can only be one task in the running state at any given time. The scheduler can move tasks between the ready and running states as needed at each tick. While running, a task may call an API function that moves it to the blocked state. These API functions can be things like the task delay or waiting for a queue or semaphore. Tasks in the blocked state do not run on the processor and cannot be selected to enter the running state. Here, the task will wait until the unblocking event has occurred, like the delay timer expiring or a semaphore being released. The task will enter the ready state and wait to be scheduled for processor time. FreeRTOS has a VTask Suspend API function that allows you to put a task into the suspended state. You can call this function from within the task itself or from another task. In the suspended state, a task cannot be selected to run just like the block state. However, only an explicit call to the VTask Resume function will allow a task to go to the ready state. This is a good way to essentially put tasks to sleep if you don't want to rely on a timer, like VTask Delay. When switching from one task to the next, the scheduler has the job of remembering exactly where the task left off and all of its working variables, including values in RAM and in the CPU registers. All of this information, where the task was in the program instructions and working memory, is known as a context, and the process of saving it all and restoring another task's context is called context switching. The free RTOS documentation has an excellent graphic and article on context switching that I recommend checking out. In Concepts Implementation's detailed example, they also walk you through the exact steps taken to perform a context switch on an AVR microcontroller. Note that the stack allocated for the task is used to store much of this context, which is why we need to allocate a minimum amount when creating a task. Let's make a simple example in Arduino showing task preemption. We'll start with our configuration setting of only using one core. We'll create some bogus string that will get printed from one task. We'll then use handles for both tasks so we can control their states from a third task. The first task counts the number of characters in the string and then prints them out to the serial terminal one by one. If we just used serial.print for the whole string, you'd find that this task would just copy the whole string to the Arduino's serial buffer, which would prevent us from seeing any interruption by the second task. So we loop over the whole string, printing one character at a time. When it's done, we put the task into the blocked state for one second. The RTOS will take care of returning this task to the ready state whenever this delay time is up. In the second task, we'll simply print out a single asterisk character every 100 milliseconds. We'll make this a higher priority task so that it will sometimes preempt the first task. In setup, we'll use a very slow serial baud rate so you can see all of this happening in real time. If we used something faster, you'd likely get the whole string in the first task printed in a single tick. I recommend adding in a delay for about a second when working with the ESP32 to give the serial a chance to connect, otherwise you end up missing some of the output. Then I'll print out a starting string along with some information about the current task. This will demonstrate that setup and loop are indeed running in their own task. We then start the two other tasks. The first task will have a priority of 1 and be assigned the handle task1. The second task will have a higher priority of 2 and be assigned the handle task2. Because we're running a third task, we can use it to control the other tasks. So let's suspend and resume task2, the one printing out the asterisks, every 2 seconds. After doing this a few times, we'll use vtask delete to completely remove the first task. I highly recommend checking to make sure the task handle is not null and then immediately setting the handle to null after deleting it. If you call vtask delete on a non-existent task, you're gonna have a bad time. As in, you'll probably overwrite some memory or cause the processor to crash and reset. Let's upload this to our ESP32. When it's done uploading, open a serial monitor. You'll need to change the baud rate to 300 so it lines up with what we wrote in code. I recommend pressing the reset button on the ESP32 to get it to start over. You should see that the setup and loop function do indeed run in their own task with priority 1 on core 1. Our pirate talk sentence should be printed at a regular interval, and you should begin to see an asterisk being printed from time to time. You'll notice that it starts and stops as we suspend and resume that task. After a moment, it should also preempt the first task, causing little stars to appear in the middle of our pirate sentence. 
When the first task is deleted, just the asterisk printing task will continue to run. Your challenge for this part is to create a program that uses two tasks to control the blinking rate of an LED. One task should listen for input on the serial terminal. When you enter a number, the delay time on the blinking LED should be updated to that time. This allows us to create a simple user interface that runs independently of the hardware being controlled. I'll add a link to one possible solution to this challenge. Good luck and happy hacking! In the next video, I'll talk about memory allocation. Stack memory, heap memory, and static memory, what those mean and how they differ from each other. We'll also get into how FreeRTOS allocates chunks of heap memory when creating tasks.